He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, siblings, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living offering, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and complete. Let love be genuine. Turn away from what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, in honor preferring one another. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve God. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but engage in humble tasks. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but provide goodness and beauty for all. If it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Then in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, Jesus said in verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Matthew 5. 14 and 15, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. And finally, in Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Well, you'll be either glad or bummed to know I'm no funnier after four weeks than I was before. So, you know, I didn't spend four weeks searching for the perfect joke to begin my message with. So, I, you know, if I make you laugh at all, it's not because there's a joke. But one of the things I did this month, or what this month actually did for me, was give me a chance to catch up more deeply with myself. I didn't really even realize how much I needed that. I spent the better part of the first two weeks alone at my brother's condominium near the beach in South Carolina. It's kind of become my, my vacation spot when I need to just be alone and pray. But I had almost two weeks this time. I got up every morning just about and went to the beach to watch the sunrise, which, you know, if you get a chance to do that, do it as much as possible. It's a holy thing. I took long walks. I unplugged more completely than I've had a chance to in a long time. And as usually happens when you risk doing that, a lot of things within me that usually got ignored or set aside or swept under some inner rug started to bubble to the surface, which is why a lot of us never get that still, right? I am happy to report that the first thing that bubbled up that took me at least a day or two to get over was just a lot of gratitude. You know, I'm so blessed, and you guys are so good to me, and it's been such a blast. I mean, this, I can't believe it's been five and a half years. Um, I never had a sabbatical or, any, you know, it, it, what a just overwhelmingly wonderful gift to be given. So I was just feeling grateful for my life and for all of you and so many things. But then... I started to feel 
some of the weight of what we've all been through in these last five years or so. And, you know, I, I, when I first put this sermon together, I, I recounted a whole bunch of these things, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to bum everybody out, and it's gonna, it, it took too much time. So that, that's not my point. But I started here in December of 2018, right in the middle of the first Trump administration. There were already deep divisions in our culture. No one politician can be blamed for that, and I'm not going to say much about the former president, except that we've all lived the wild ride of his personality's presence at the center of our culture and media that just this last week culminated in him being convicted of, found guilty of 34 counts of fraud and falsification of business records. My message isn't going to focus on that, but this is what we've all been just kind of dealing with. And none of us knows what this electoral year in which, in which he's likely to be the nominee for the Republican Party, we don't know what that's going to be like, but it's probably not going to be without a lot of conflict in this culture. And again, this is not about him now. I'm sharing with you what came up for me because as your pastor, I spend a lot of time wondering, what's my role? What am I supposed to say or not say? How do we deal with this stuff? I, the, the, the war in Gaza, that came up. I, I will be honest. These last couple of months, I've not known what to do, what to say. It's unspeakable. So, yeah, that stuff that I, as a pastor, sit with and live with, and I hope you know how deeply I, I ask myself and wrestle what do we need to hear when we come to church? You, you sure don't need a recounting of the last week's headlines. You can watch the news for yourself. But we do need to somehow come to terms with, as people of faith, who we are and what we're called to. What's the role of the church in a society, especially one in which there's lots of conflict? So I felt a lot of that. And then, you know, again, I'm not going to get into it deeply, but it was the pandemic. A lot of us are just starting to really come to terms with what that did to us. And especially those of you, you kids, teenagers, man, I have a niece who graduated from high school this last year, and, and I was part of some conversations where they were talking about, yeah, you know, High school was weird for us. And I think about those who, who graduated during the pandemic, who ended their graduation ceremony by hitting and leave meeting. I mean, we're just now starting to come to terms with it. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, we are blessed, but a lot of churches didn't make it through the pandemic. And we're doing great, thank God. But a lot fell apart and couldn't figure out how to do that. And, and the clergy who presided in those churches during that time are probably never going to get over this sense of, of inadequacy and failure that that left them with. So uh, you get the point, right? We're just all dealing with a lot of stuff. And, and I could go on and on. You know, what would come up for you if you had two weeks to walk the beach and think? As I walked the beach and made space for everything within me that I'd been ignoring or avoiding or just too busy or distracted to allow to show up, I noticed that just about every person I came across was on their cell phone, even on the beach, unless they were swimming. And even some of that, I even noticed some people just made darn sure that they, you know, they didn't get too far out there, taking pictures. And I thought about that, man. Talking, scrolling, email, social media, algorithms, artificial intelligence, always connected and available, always being sold and shaped and manipulated in terms of what shows up on our screens, what holds us on our screens, and why. Now, I said I wasn't going to get into all of this, so I'm, I, you know, I'm done. But 
except underneath it all was also the wars and the ticking time bomb of climate change. I don't know about you, but I rarely allow myself to be honest about how I really feel about that. I have grandkids, one who's 21. Good but painful conversations when you get honest there. And then I feel, man, we really let the kids down. We baby boomers. So, all that. Now, here's why I'm starting my message with that. Because, thank God, that's not how my sabbatical ended. But if we're not careful, these things that I just mentioned and plenty more become just about all you ever see. And I don't blame people for avoiding it or just shutting it down, or like, I'm not going to watch the news. I watched a whole lot less than I usually do, or listened, read, a whole lot less, because most of it is not telling us anything new, and most of it is just weighing us down more and more and more when we're already heavy. And it can become almost anything you see. So here's my whole point this morning. While my sabbatical stillness began with my needing to feel a bunch of heavy things, and I really did need to feel them, denial and avoidance rarely helps you get anywhere healthy. I had a crossing over point which came to me in large point or part through reading the latest book of my dear friend Brian McLaren. And I really hope I can get Brian to come here and spend some time with us sometime as a congregation. Such a beautiful guy. He just released a new book. It's on climate change. And I wasn't really looking forward to reading it, primarily because of the title. The title is Life After Doom. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is going to be depressing. This is going to be heavy. The subtitle is Finding Wisdom and Courage in Troubling Times. So, I'm going to end, not yet, but <laughs> eventually <laughs> I will end by quoting from this book. But I just described, you know, a lot of the world's darkness, we could say. We're talking about Jesus in the light. We always have to be careful when we use that light-darkness dichotomy that we don't go off on a tangent where all things dark are bad because of the racist implications of that. Light is not white. Light is energy. And as Jesus referred to it, it's the energy of love. And yes, we've got our own unique experience of darkness in this broken world and in our own individual lives, but Jesus is telling us that when the darkness is the most thick and heavy, I mean, this is why the breakthrough for those who are addicts and alcoholics, I mean, you bottom out. It gets the darkest. And interestingly, that's when the breakthrough is closest. When it gets thick and heavy, that's when the energy of light is most needed and often most able to break through. So it hit me, what are we going to do if this world gets even darker? And this isn't going to strike you as anything brilliant. But it all of a sudden it occurred to me, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be the light. We are going to double down on being the presence of light 
in this world. Not because we have everything all figured out. It's not a matter of being right. It's a matter of anchoring ourselves in the energy of the love of God. That's what we need to not get swept away. And that's our gift to the world. And so this is how my sabbatical ended. And the message I got in large part from Brian's book was that no matter how dark it gets, our job is to be the light. That's who we are. We will be a circle of light and love and healing, a place where people who feel lost can get found, can get their bearings again, a pe people who feel lost in addiction or some self-destructive personal tangent can find the truth and the light and the love that brings healing. We're going to be that. No matter what happens out there, that's our gift. And in a world of corruption, lies, selfishness, greed, and violence, we'll double down on being the light. And those things that Paul describes so beautifully in Romans 12 will be genuine. Love is genuine. We'll turn away from what's evil, not run from it, not duck it, but we will not embrace it and we will not fight it with its own consciousness either. We'll hold fast to what's good. We'll outdo each other in showing mutual affection. If we're going to compete at all, it's going to be who's going to be the most loving and kind around here. Spare us from your ego trips in that regard, please. We're going to live in harmony with each other. We're going to not be arrogant. We'll engage in humble tasks. We won't claim that we're any wiser than we are. And we sure as heck won't repay anyone evil even if they direct it toward us. But instead, we'll overcome evil with beauty and with goodness. I guess why that hit me so hard is that we can do that and be that no matter what happens anywhere else. No matter what this world or anyone can ever throw at you, they do not have the power to knock you off the center of who you are in the spirit. That's up to you. So you want to change the world of darkness? Then be the light. And the only way to be the light is for God, light, love, the Tao, whatever you want to call it, for that to be alive and shining and vital in and through us. You can't fake the light. You open up to it and then let it come through you. And like a prism, we'll each have our own ways of shining it, our own gifts. We'll do that as individuals and as communities. So what I'm saying is let's be a community that glows with the light. Okay, so uh, let's even say that. Let's, uh, let's glow. We'll say it together on, on three. Ready? One, two, three. Let's glow. It should be a T-shirt for our church, I think. McFarland UCC, let's glow. All right. Here's the quote from Brian's book. He talked about how he had realized he'd become addicted to what he called the ugly story. The bad news that's sold to us and fed to us constantly by the corporate news media. He said that being people of light means reminding ourselves and each other that while the darkness of this world's brokenness may get dark and heavy, the light is always stronger. It's always more brilliant and more powerful. We need to dare to trust that, to really believe that. Sometimes I think we feel like, oh, our little light our little love, focus on love, it's nothing in the, for, in the face of this world's brokenness and evil and ugliness. Yes, it is. In fact, it's the only thing that will overcome it in the end. So he said, this means that every time ugliness presents itself within ourselves, on the news, wherever, after noticing it, 
becoming more aware of it, grieving it, maybe even feeling frustrated or furious about it, we commit ourselves to overcoming the ugly with the practice of the beautiful and the joyful, celebrating and adding to the beauty that abounds, the goodness in the world that's worth standing for and in the right sense fighting for. This is the part I loved. He said, a few months ago, I was helping lead a retreat in the mountains of North Carolina. And on the last night together, we did something I haven't done in way too long a time. We had a campfire. We roasted marshmallows and passed around popcorn. And around the campfire, people started sharing beauty. One recited a Wendell Berry poem he had memorized. Another recited a Mary Oliver poem. But each person brought something beautiful to share. A professional musician shared some songs, no amplification, just his voice and the guitar, but then he handed his guitar to some not-so-professional musicians, and they shared the music that flowed from their hearts. Several people shared stories. Some were very touching, some very funny, some both. A few shared some jokes, apart from the carbon released from a few oak logs. No fossil fuels were burned and no electricity was needed. We entertained each other for an evening for free. It was delightful, beautiful. One of the happiest nights I can remember. And I thought, beauty is strong. This is what goodness overcoming evil feels like. In the coming decades, or if the coming decades are anywhere near as challenging as I expect them to be, there will be a flood of ugly news to report every day and every week. That news can dominate your life if you're not careful. It can drain your life. But that night around the campfire, I could imagine people gathering in small circles of beauty everywhere. Front porches, living rooms, forest clearings around kitchen tables, even in churches and synagogues and mosques. It wouldn't require anything fancy. If they were outside, no screens, no earbuds, no technology, except maybe to connect with friends who want to be there virtually, if possible. But all it would take would be people being present to each other, reminding each other of all that's good and beautiful and true. That's our gift. All right, there's more, but I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to say, so after reading this and other things that he wrote, it inspired me. I think we need to have campfires this summer. Yeah. We have a perfect, perfect pit out there for it. And we can play some games. We had fun with family nights. But everybody bring something beautiful. Bring something to offer. You might not get to do it every time, but... And let's just remind each other of how much goodness there is. And that will strengthen each other to do whatever struggling, pushing back, we might also have to do at some point. In other words, let's glow. All right. Amen.